This is the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we teach you the proven methods to grow your seven-figure business to 10 million and beyond. Please welcome your host, Brett Gilliland. Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast. I'm thrilled this week to be able to introduce you to Dan McGaw. Dan is an award-winning entrepreneur, speaker, and CEO of McGaw.io, which is an analytics and marketing technology consultancy. Uh, He also uh, runs a SaaS platform called UTM.io, and I'll have him explain both of those things. But before I do, I want to share that Dan has been a mentor. He's in the, the 500 Startups Mentor program. He lives and operates out of Orlando. He's got a couple of awesome French bulldogs, it looks like, three sons, amazing wife in, in Orlando, Florida. So, Dan, welcome to our show. Please tell us a little bit about your businesses. I want to hear about McGaw and UTM and just give our audience a feel for who you are and what you're doing. Yeah, and thanks so much for having me. Looking forward to being able to do this. Um, you know, I'm a born entrepreneur, so I've I've been starting companies since the ripe age of 13. So, you know, I just naturally am always trying to start other companies. Currently, right now, I am the CEO of Magal.io, which is a, a revenue infrastructure and marketing infrastructure consulting company where we help companies choose tools, integrate tools, operate those tools, and then ultimately grow their business, leveraging their tech stack. And then on the flip side of that, you know, one of the things that we get an opportunity to see at Magal.io is we get to see a lot of analytical problems. And we get to see a lot of problems customers face. So we t- we tend to create products to help solve those uh, problems that they have. And when we started this company seven years ago, really quickly after that, we noticed we noticed that a lot of companies have a hard time using UTMs to track their campaigns, especially when they're on a large team. So uh, we built another product, which at the time earlier was just called the effing amazing UTM builder. Uh, However, it was rebranded to UTM.io about four years ago. Uh, And now that's its own brand where it helps companies ultimately uh, create campaign tracking codes at scale across hundreds of users uh, and then effectively make their campaign links for tracking all their campaigns. So our customers over there are big multi-billion dollar multinational companies. We do have an amazing free product so anybody can use it. Um, That being said, our ideal customer profile is typically a large multinational uh, company um, or has many different locations. So even like franchises and case like that uh, fit into that mold. Well, none of our listeners are going to fit into the large multinational companies, um, but some of them might be in the multi-location spot that you talked about. And whether or not they are an ideal fit for anything that you do, Mm -hmm. we appreciate you making the time to be here with us because you have a lot of growth lessons that all of them can benefit from. So that's our goal today is to figure out how do we share some of the amazing experience you've had in 20 years plus in this space in the you know 20 plus minutes that we have together. So <laughs> that's the that's the trick. Uh, so as you think, Dan, about just, just thinking back to some of the companies that you've grown past that million dollar mark, especially if you've grown them to the multi-million dollar stage uh, and even into eight figures, what what are some of the things that stand out to you as lessons you had to learn about growing a business beyond you know the the expertise or the experience of you as the founder, right? So there's a transition there that a lot of business owners have to make. And it sounds like you've done this multiple times. So what are some of the lessons you've learned as you've made that transition? Yeah, you know, it's a really, really hard time to transition yourself out of the business, uh, especially when you're an operator like myself, you know, uh, the thing that you always struggle with is as, as an entrepreneur and as a CEO, you're, you're focused mainly on consistency, right? You're trying to be consistent with things to really grow the business. And the biggest thing you have to worry about is as you start to hand those reins off to other people is how do you make sure that that consistency or quality of play, as I would say, um, is also kept up with. You know, the, the biggest thing about like making that process successful, honestly, when you're trying to leave the company is giving people good job descriptions, making sure that people understand what their objectives are, and then as well as giving them proper training. So if you are trying to migrate yourself out of the company and replace yourself, you've got to make sure that you understand what your job description is. And then how are you going to separate that job description into multiple roles? Um, and then how are you going to give them the appropriate, um, as we say, observable indicators, which are typically like the metrics um, that you're going to measure people on? I mean, at the end of the day, um, if you can't measure people, you can't manage them. And if you don't have metrics at which they know they're uh, um, uh, trying to accomplish, 
then you have no proper way to manage them. And, and this is where a lot of CEOs and a lot of founders go wrong is they just hire people and then they're like, well, I'll give them feedback. And the problem is, is you can give them feedback, but then it becomes a pissing match of you versus them. And, you know, that's not a good, healthy conversation to have. And that's where going back to the metrics and the observable indicators, it makes it so it's no longer me versus you or um, my opinion versus your opinion. It's we're either hitting our goals or we're not. Um, and you want something that's like separate from those two to really make sure that um, you can push on those people. Because if you are trying to graduate out of your business and become a, a chairman, right, a founder, as I would say, of a company compared to the CEO, um, you've got to have the proper uh, ways to manage people. And usually that comes down to the metrics. Well, and even if you're not trying to get out of the company, I, I think a lot of business owners struggle to actually fully move into a CEO seat because they're holding off onto too many of the the day to day things that have to get done. Right. So, yeah. but I love what you're saying. Let, let's talk a little bit more about those metrics for people. If you hire somebody in to do a job and you and you hire them based on a job title and like a laundry list of responsibilities, that's not enough clarity for them to actually own something and know if they're doing it. And so I love the concept you're bringing up. Is there a way to get a little more practical with, I don't know, maybe an example or things you've learned about getting clarity with people on those roles and what, what ownership you're giving to someone? Yeah. You know, I think the job description is massively important. Um, and I think a lot of companies kind of fail when they write a job description. You know, in our company, one of the things we have to focus on is, you know, we hire very, very experienced marketers, very experienced business people that are previously have been a consultant. Um, and they're coming in to give other CEOs or CMOs advice and tips on how to run their businesses. And the only way to really be able to do that effectively is to have a really good job description. So, you know, their job description tells you, of course, what are the required skills you need to have for the role? What are the responsibilities? Um, and as well as like, what are the benefits? But in every one of our job descriptions, there is a uh, long job description written out, which explain what success looks like for your first six months. What are you going to do in your first 30 days? What are you going to do in your first 90? And then what are you going to do in your first six months? And what this does is it forces the person who is hiring to actually make sure they have a plan for that person. And that's usually what, what screws all this up is that we just hire somebody because we have a need, but we never think, what is it going to take to make them successful? What are the metrics they're going to need to do uh, to make them successful? Okay, great. If they're successful, how do they make me successful? And that job description is just so critical. Most people just kind of wing it. Uh, but really, you should have their first six months, first 30, first 90, first 180 written out um, so that way you can onboard them appropriately. Um, but also make sure in that job description, you have what their observable indicators are and as well as um, when they need to hit those observable indicators by. Um, you know, there's a great book by uh, Jeff Smart, which is called Who, uh, yeah. which is all about hiring, the top grader process. And we took a lot of learnings out of that on our hiring programs. We made a lot of changes from him uh, or his book. Um, but, you know, I think it's really, really important to be aligned before you ever hire somebody because, um, if you wait until after they're hired and then you try to align, you're only going to waste money because you're going to lose a, a a good candidate that should be in a different role. Yeah, love that. All of that. You said so many things in that space, but I want to I want to circle back to one you said earlier, which is when when you don't have those measurable indicators, right, or those observable indicators, I think you call yeah. them, or metrics or KPIs or whatever you end up calling <laughs> them. If you don't have those, then then it is it is a matter of opinion, and we're just going to. We're going to have maybe differences of, of opinion about how well the performance is happening. And, you know, I, I like to assume most people are good people and they want to do good work. And I, and I, I yeah. imagine you see them that way as well. It's not a matter of, is this a good person who, who does good work? It's just the lack of clarity that usually messes all this up. So I love how, how you're pushing on the clarity. What, what would you say to somebody who says, what do, you, what do you mean I got to spell it all out for six months? I'm hiring somebody who should know what they need to do. And why do I have to get this much clarity? And like maybe I'm taking all the autonomy out of it. What, how would you respond to somebody thinking that way about the level of specificity that you're talking about? Yeah, you know, this is uh, funny because I've learned through failure so much in regards to this uh, hiring VPs that, you know, they're supposed to be VPs. They're supposed to tell me what to do. Um, and, you know, that that assumption is is pretty flawed. And at the end of the day, people don't know what they're supposed to do unless you tell them. In many cases, um, there's a reason why they're an employee and we're a CEO or a founder. And that's because at the end of the day, they're looking for somebody to help lead them while they can also help lead other people. Right. But if you're not leading them, then it does make it really difficult for them to know where they're going. 
Um, you know, one thing that I, I know that we have struggled with here is um, trying to keep alignment of our team as we've grown. I mean, we've been very, very lucky over the last 90 days. We doubled the team. The 90 days before that, we doubled the team as well. Um, over the last 120 days, we doubled our revenue um, on a monthly basis. So it can be really hard as you're growing quickly to keep everybody aligned. And for 2022, one of my core objectives at the by the end of this year, I need to have um, OKRs rolled out for the entire team. So objectives and key results for everybody to understand. And I have my OKRs and then they basically choose their OKRs that roll up to mine. No matter who you hire, if you don't have a good job description for them, you don't have good ob objectives outlined for them, they don't understand what their metrics are, they don't know where they're going, right? It's very similar to driving a car but not being allowed to use your hands and not being allowed to use your eyes. So you have to make sure that you give them a direction. Now, once you give them that direction, autonomy comes from them making their own decisions, like you not micromanaging them. But they have to have, they need to know where the ditches are, right? There's an old Irish phrase when you're drunk and driving, keep it between the ditches, right? Like if you don't help them understand where the ditches are, they're never going to be able to understand where they're headed. So you do have to provide them very, very deep specificity in regards to this stuff. Now, I'm not telling you write a 16 page monologue, right? Our job description is still able to fit on two and a half pieces of paper, right? It's not crazy. However, it gives everybody very good clarity. And I'll, I'll use my VP of sales as an example. You know, um, Asa, amazing uh, VP of sales come to us from uh, multiple other amazing companies. Um, Asa has a very well written job description. And you know, three months in, Asa was missing some of his observable indicators. So we went back to his job description. We sat down and we highlighted things in red, which were bad, things in yellow, which were caution, and things in green, which we felt we accomplished. And, you know, I was able to say to Asa, hey, this is where I think we have to work. This is where we really need your attention. And, um, you know, within a matter of a few weeks, all the things in red had been moved to yellow. All the things in yellow had been moved to green. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we're so successful with our sales division here is because that job description gave us each a way to align and then have a contract under this is what we're all uh, accomplishing. And then when it's not being hit, you know, I have something to point back to and say, you agreed to this um, and I can I can strike that out or I can uh, emphasize something. So it is it is extremely important. You just can't uh, expect people to guide you. They're not the founder. They're not the CEO. It's your job to lead them. Yeah. And can you imagine if there were, let's say you have super capable VPs across every function, even if they are leaders who could just lead that function on their own, if they're all going different directions, that's not a unified team taking targeted coordinated action. And, and our job is to set the vision, build the team to go accomplish it and make sure that we have enough fuel to go make it happen, right? Like that's our, those are our main jobs as a leader and everything you're saying is spot on in my opinion, Dan. So I love that you're talking about Let's help them be clear about what success looks like. And I've heard so many analogies around this, but the the between the keeping it between the ditches, that's the first time I've heard that one. So it just it, whether you give them a as some some borders or some guard guardrails or you tell them where the ditches are, fine. Let them operate between the ditches, but they got to know where danger lies and more importantly, what success looks like and how we're going to measure it. So awesome. Thank you for sharing all of that very practical experience about how to how to keep things clear with team members. Let's let's shift topics for a minute. Uh, something you said has kind of caught my attention. I'm sure it caught others' attention. Doubling your revenue in the past, what did you say, 120 days? Uh, yeah. Doubling your team over the last, you know, month after month. Like that's that's serious growth. What considerations for you as the business owner? Are you trying to make sure stays in place or, or that you stay in ahead of to, to enable that growth? Because growth is great, but it's not always easy to handle. Like it can be painful too. So um, what are some of the things you're doing to be intentional about keeping up with the growth? Yeah, uh, growth is great, but growth also sucks. Like I will not deny it. I am slightly burnt out right now and I want to take a vacation, but I can't because we're growing so fast. Um, growth can be really, really fun. But the biggest thing that we're focused on, you know, we're in a service based business as a consulting company. So the number one thing that we are focused on is maintaining quality. Um, and to maintain quality, we have to have really, really good training. So we have designed a very, very specific training process um, that enables our leaders of the team to be able to train their team and then their team to train the people below them. So we have a huge emphasis on creating standard operating procedure just around about everything. 
And that's something that, you know, we put into play around a year and a half ago. Um, we use a product called Guru, uh, which is a Chrome extension that we basically have our wiki in, our knowledge base, and people can search for things directly from that, that Chrome extension so they can look at wherever they are. It's got checklists, everything in it. But I have to say training, onboarding um, is the biggest thing because we want to maintain quality. And the big difference about us and a lot of our competitors in the space is that we, we are hyper vigilant on having it so every experience you have is the same. Meanwhile, the problem may be different. So like, I mean, I'll look at one client. We have a service titan who's a large multi-billion dollar software for the trades, right? So if you're an HVAC or pipe or a plumber or anything, you use that tool to run your business. Um, completely different than another company called Byheart, which is a baby formula company, right? Like they're making baby formula. However, the experience that they get with working with us should be exactly the same, right? They should have the same hospitality from all of our team members. They should have the same note taking. They should have the same project management. Um, they should have the same theory in regards to analytics and marketing operations. And that's something that we have to focus heavily on in our training program. How do we train that? How do we get people into the culture and how do we get people going? So, you know, I think the training uh, is a huge part of that. And then I just say the second part that I most worry about is keeping our company culture. Um, our company mission and our company culture are extremely, extremely important. And I can definitely say this. We would not be growing at the rate that we are now if it was not for the culture that we created and cultivated around two or three years ago. And I, I really have to say three years ago and before our culture was crap. Our company was doing, we were well-respected, but we were not growing at the rate that we needed to. We were not aligned. But once we really set the stake in the ground and chose our mission, chose our culture, built that into our company process, you know, no longer is it a pissing match between me and somebody else. We can simply say, hey, listen, that's not using hospitality to earn trust. Um, and they immediately go, you're 100% right. That's one of our values. We've got we've to change this. So training and culture, I think, go hand in hand. And Pete Drucker had said, uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? So I think culture is the, the thing that you really have to build into that training program as well. Well, Dan, uh, you, you're singing music to my ears right now. Uh, you, you probably haven't heard my previous episodes with guests, but I'm usually like asking the questions to, to tease out the, the role of values and culture and stuff like that. But you just went right to it. And, and it's fascinating to me that somebody in your seat, I'll say, somebody with 20 plus years of experience in lots of growth companies to be in this place and say, for us to achieve the growth that we have, it comes down to well, obviously hiring the right people, but onboarding and training them for success and maintaining our culture. That's what you said. You didn't say anything about getting the next sale or increasing our site traffic or, you know, and I know all of that stuff's important, but to handle growth, to enable growth, not just handle, but to enable it, you pointed to consistency and delivery that we're going to do through training and onboarding our people and making sure we keep this amazing culture we've created. That's pretty powerful for you to unsolicited, you know, to share those things unsolicitedly. Is that a word? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. So you said your, your culture wasn't great two or three years ago. How did you start to make changes? Because some people are at a place that you were a few years ago and, and they're saying, yeah, we don't do that well. And maybe I'll never do that well, or maybe I can't do that well. Please give them some thoughts about steps they can take to, to start doing that. You know, I read this book called Culture Wins, which was a really, really good book for me to understand how to put these things into play. Uh, and that book really helped me kind of understand like the way that other companies uh, use their culture and interwork that with their day-to-day -day operations. And that was something that was really, really helpful um, for me. And I think that book really kind of helped me kind of push forward. But I think like in, there was a multiple books that I read that helped me just better understand what I needed to change about not only myself, but as well as about the culture here um, to make it a successful organization. Because, you know, there's the book um, Principles by Ray Dalio. Uh, Ray's a, the most successful hedge fund manager in the world, period, right? $160 billion in assets under management. Um, but one of the problems that Ray was running into is he was trying to get people to follow like the Bridgewater Associates process is that there were no principles. It was just it was Ray's opinion. Right. And you have to change that. This isn't the CEO's opinion. This is a part of the company. And by creating your values or your company principles, which we have values, which is our top five. And then we have our principles, which are the ones underneath that, the things that we believe in just really changes the uh, direction. But the thing that I think that I had to take into focus so much is that, you know, we've had these values for longer, a long time. We've had these values for probably the last five or six years. 
but we didn't really live them in work. And then I sure as hell did not live them. I was not the most effective leader. I was not the most effective manager. I didn't live by our values. And when I'm not living by the company values, it means nobody else is going to. Um, and, you know, there was some failure that we had that really led to me having to kind of like look within and be able to say like, hey, I'm the problem here. And, you know, I made a mission to fix that. And, you know, very fortunately, we did. Um, I read a lot of amazing books that helped me kind of get there. I think um, Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday. His other book, Stillness is the Key, is also a really good book um, that helped me just better understand leadership and things like that uh, around different ways to manage the business. So I don't want to tell a company that, you know, if you don't have value, you, you can't be successful. If you don't have a company culture, you can't be successful. But I can definitely tell you if you don't have it, you're going to struggle, right? Um, you know, I was the head of marketing at Kiss Metrics, one of the pioneers in marketing analytics. And when I got to that company, we had a poster on the wall that said what our company values were. It was not mixed into anything that we did. It was nothing. It was never brought up. It was not in anything. It was just some stupid poster. And you know, the number one reason why Kiss Metrics failed was bad culture, bad leadership, bad teamwork. Um, and if all of those things would have been fixed, we would still be the number one analytics provider for marketing analytics. Um, but we couldn't get that right, uh, which meant nobody was doing anything collectively. We we're all running in 10 different directions, which is going back to what you talked about earlier. If you have bad leadership and they're not setting good metrics, you're running in all different directions. It doesn't help anybody. Well, I, I didn't plan on saying this, Dan, um, but ba based on that last comment, nobody can see my shirt today. My shirt says the best leaders build the best businesses and the best businesses win is what it says on the back. <laughs> Do you agree with that statement? Yeah, no, absolutely. You, you know, and I'm still working on my leadership every single day. You know, I, I was very lucky to start a company when I was 13 years old and that company was somewhat successful. Uh, and then I've gone through multiple other companies, but um, I was never... A great leader. And that's something that uh, I still don't think I'm a great leader. And I don't know if I ever will think I'm a great leader. Um, but my goal is to become a great leader. Um, and I'll never be the one who can say that about myself. Hopefully other people one day will say that. Um, but if you're not a great leader, you're not going to build a great business. Well, I could keep talking to you about this forever. We need, to, <laughs> we need to go ahead and wrap it up. But your thoughts about the enabling role of, of culture that takes it out of the I guess the domain or the expertise or the the singular singular responsibility of the leader to like maintain a vision or a culture by him or herself to one of now the business has its own identity. There is a set of values. There is a way of thinking. There is a way of doing and being that is separate from any one individual leader. And when you start to make that transition, that's game changing and enables you to do stuff that you couldn't do otherwise. And I just really appreciate you sharing your own journey through some of those growth stages as a leader. And I love that you you said I you know I'm, I, it's not like I've arrived as a leader. It, it is a journey, and you're working on it now. But uh, the best the best time to plant a shade tree was 20 years ago, and the the next <laughs> best time is now, right? And so you're working yeah. on it now. And at some point, you'll have this great shade tree of uh, called leadership, and people will find refuge under that shade tree and go, isn't this a great shade tree? And, you, and you'll feel like maybe some of that journey has been worthwhile for you. Yeah, for sure. I'm planting shade trees everywhere. Yeah, you have to, right? Because your your business is growing so fast. Who's, who, who are going to be the leaders of, of tomorrow or the next quarter, right? The ones that you have now need to be grown into that. Or you're going to keep bringing in people from the outside, which just puts your culture at risk uh, if you do it too much, right? So Anyway, yeah. we could keep talking. How, how do people learn more about Dan McGaw or McGaw.io? Where, where do people go to learn about you, connect with you, do all that stuff? Yeah, the best thing I tell people to do is go to LinkedIn and look up Dan McGaw. You'll find me on there. Uh, I always have the hiring badge on my profile, but I'm most active on there. Please chime into the conversation. I'm always posting something, always trying to engage something. And I'm always happy to answer questions. So always feel free to shoot me a message uh, and do that. If you're interested in learning more about how to set up your tech stack and how to build your uh, company into the future, definitely go to maga.io. My last name is M-C-G-A-W and then .io after that. And you'll be able to find all the free resources we have on our website to kind of help you out. You mentioned, I forgot about this. So just now, but you mentioned a book, a resource that people oh, yeah. do. Why don't you go ahead and share about that and then we'll wrap. 
Yeah, of course. Yeah, I wrote a book about a year ago called Build Cool Shit. Uh, it's the modern uh, blueprint to building your tech stack for your business so you can grow it. It's actually featuring a case study from a couple clients uh, on how we grew their businesses by rewiring their tech stack. Uh, I'd love to give everybody a free copy. Um, all you have to do is if you pull out your cell phone, uh, I know you're probably listening to this on your cell phone, right? Pull out your cell phone, go to your text messages. Um, you're going to text this phone number. So it's 415 415- 915-9011. The phone number is 415-915-9011. And if you text the word MarTech, so M-A-R-T-E-C-H, just text the word MarTech to that number and it will actually collect all of your information and I'll ship you a free copy directly to your house if you're in the United States. If you're not in the United States, we'll send you a PDF to your inbox. Awesome. Well, thank you for the generous offer for folks. And um, more than the book that you just offered to give, I really appreciate the insights in your own very real and personal journey as you've grown amazing companies, including the one that you're running now. So thanks so much for being a guest with us today, Dan. I really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. All right. For those of you listening, please share, like, review, do all those things to make sure that everybody possible, all seven-figure business owners that you know, can listen to this interview that I had with Dan. We aim to help as many seven-figure business owners as possible receive the ideas and practical experience from our guests that will help them in their own growth journey. We'll see you next time on the next episode. You've been listening to the Elite Entrepreneurs Podcast with your host, Brett Gillerland. Be sure to leave a rating and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. You may also want to visit our website, EliteEntrepreneursPodcast.com, to find additional resources to grow your business from seven figures to 10 million and beyond.